So welcome everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Cindy Olson. Uh, I was a former CHRO of Enron years ago and the founder of the Executive Strategic Alliance, or as we like to refer, refer to it, ESA. And my belief was when we founded ESA that every CHRO and CIO should have access to unbelievable thought leaders just like I did way back uh, 20 years ago. So that's what we do is we bring world-class, great provocative thought leaders to our network. Before I get, we get started, just a couple of housekeeping items. One, obviously you saw we are recording this because there were several people that had reached out and asked if we were gonna record it. And I told them the yes. So the recording and the PowerPoint slides that Sean's gonna share will definitely be sent to those that registered and were not able to attend and those registered and did attend as a follow-up. And then feel free to ask questions, you guys. I think it's really important. You've got a couple of great thought leaders and an executive here that can answer any question you've got. You can either put your question in chat or you can raise your hand and I'll be the one that monitors and make sure that your questions are answered. So for the fast, past five years, we at ESA have partnered with ADP to build our community and we've delivered world-class thought leadership, encouraging employees to, and executives to really think about how to shape the future of work. And we're unique in that we bring CHROs and CIOs together in our community because we fundamentally believe that the CHRO and the CIO have got to be in lockstep to deliver the kind of worker experience that's especially critical today as far as talent. Our community currently has over, uh, has over a couple thousand participants from 20 cities, and we've developed relationships with thought leaders such as Deloitte, McKinsey, the Hackett Group, Spencer Thomas, the Chapman Leadership Institute, among others, and of course, ADP. We've recently offered to our network the opportunity to be a work tech startup advisor where executives are exposed to the latest startup technologies and the potential for startup advisory board positions. And then finally, it, we're introducing a board positioning membership in our community in January that will help those executives that want to pursue a public board, private board, or startup board position, the resources and access to be able to find that perfect board seat. Today, I'm really excited about to discuss the latest compensation data. Uh, this, is, this is a critical issue, uh, especially today with the, the situation with talent in every single organization. And we've got three amazing people here to share insights and also lead a discussion around this topic. Sean Paris, who is a product leader specializing in business intelligence and the owner of ADP's Real Income subscription product. Uh, he is, it's now available as of July of this year to any CHRO, regardless of what HCM that they're on. And what I, I find exciting about this is ADP has some of the most current and best compensation data in the industry. And now you can have access to that, even if you're on another HCM provider. I, I, I remember I, I spent personally, we spent thousands and of dollars on uh, compensation data way back in the day. So this is amazing. David Tereski, who was at ADP and the chief product owner for the ADP Data Cloud when I met him about five years ago. Uh, he founded his own consulting company about a year and a half ago around people analytics and compensation management and recently he sold his consulting practice to salary.com and launched the HR Data Labs podcast, which is now one of the most popular in its category. Category, And finally, we've got Heather Benjamin Brown, who I've known for about 10 years. She's a rock star executive. She's unique in that, in that she leads for Calpine. And by the way, Calpine operates power plants all over the country. She runs eight, she leads HR and IT and facilities and supply chain. So she does it all. And we're really excited to have her to share some of the insights around why she believes that compensation data is so important to every CHRO and CIO today. So with that, Sean, I'm gonna let you take it over, start sharing your screen and you it's, it's all yours. All right, can you hear me okay, Cindy? Yeah, I can hear you. Can everybody else? Perfectly. Yeah. Okay, oh, perfect. perfect, all right. 
Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for the kind introduction, Cindy. I really appreciate that. And um, what we wanted to do is start our conversation off uh, by sharing some statistics with you. Um, these are pulled from uh, ADP's National Employment Report. Uh, as you know, that's uh, published on a monthly basis. But um, you know, I think this really this really sets up the the background story to to what we've all heard. You know, the the Great Resignation. I heard the Sandsdemic recently. Um, last week, I heard something called the Great Rudeness, and I'm not sure if you've heard that, but what that refers to is individuals uh, in retail and hospitality and service industries that have been having to put up with rude customers over the last 18 months now have choices and don't have to do that anymore. So uh, I heard that and I like that one, so I wanted to bring that one forward today. Um, but let's take a look at some of the workforce trends really as, as a backdrop for, for our conversation that we're going to have around compensation today. Um, you know, I, I read an article last week that uh, the wage level has increased it to its, its greatest extent in, in over two decades now. And you can see there at uh, 3122, which is a dollar increase since this time last year. Um, certainly, we're seeing employment growth as well, 4.1% increase over this time last year. Um, and turnover rate, I believe last time I looked, was around 70%, 71%, which is a 6.8% increase uh, over last year. I'm told that uh, increased turnover is a sign of a recovering economy. So perhaps that'll be good news uh, for us. Um, you know, I think before I move to the to the next statistics, you know, what I would say about that is, you know, the the um, environment uh, that we're navigating through right now, you know, with with the COVID and all of its impacts and impl implications, um, inflation, not just from a wage standpoint, but from a pricing standpoint as well, um, to the labor shortage, uh, the labor shortage that we're experiencing has really produced some factors that are playing together in a way that I think it makes it very difficult for us to know what to expect uh, over the next 12 months, certainly over the next 24 months. We're going to talk about some of that today, but um, these are definitely different times, times not many of us, any of us, I think, have ever tried to navigate through uh, before. So to the extent that we can have good data to help us, um, I think it's only going to make things easier for us. Um, if you look down at the, at the band just below, um, this gives you a sense on wage inflation amongst job holders, job switchers, and entrance into the workforce. And I highlighted job switchers because that's where we're seeing our greatest increase. Those that are jumping from one job to the next, um, that's really the challenge for all of us. People have choices now. Workers have choices now like they never have before with wages continuing to rise. Folks are looking around and saying, hey, you know, I, I don't have to be here anymore. There may be something better out there for me. So retention, critical, attraction, critical, and we're gonna address some of that today. Let's take a look at some other statistics as a backdrop here. So the gap is widening. Um, pulled this uh, statistic here to help support our conversation today. The gap between job openings and hires, take a look at that trend line from 2016 up in here until this past summer. It has never been wider from job openings versus those that are actually being hired. So that's factoring in with increased wages, creating a really difficult situation for those, those of us that are responsible uh, for bringing talent into our organization. Uh, this, is, this is definitely something that we're, we're seeing day to day. ADP, we're hearing this from our clients. Um, and this is causing a lot of knee-jerk reactions for sure when it comes to setting compensation wages. I'm not sure we need to, but that's certainly what we're seeing. I, I remember, you know, the 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 sign out in front of Domino's on the way to, to work this morning, you know, a thousand dollars for delivery drivers is a signing bonus. I mean, my goodness, you know, Crazy. if Domino's is doing that, what else is going on out there? Yeah. Um, and finally, before we uh, get into our conversation to, you know, declining labor participation is, is, is certainly another factor um, that we have to consider. So as you, as you look at this, um, this, uh, this chart here from the Pew Research Center, you can see that in February 21, participation rate um, was 61%, per three, uh, 61%, whereas last year at this time it was 63%. Um, and it's, it's less la labor participation, both for women and men in the workforce. So you kind of step back and you look at all of it, lower, uh, lower labor participation, widening gap between open requisitions and hires, increasing wages, 
and it's quite a difficult situation <laughs> for people in our line of work to navigate through. Um, so with that, let's have a conversation about it. Let's talk about what we're seeing out there. Hope you enjoy the little fall background there. But, uh, but Heather, I'll, I'll uh, open this up with you. I mean, just given some of the data points that I've, I've shared with you, you know, what are, your, some, what are some of your observations in the overall employment climate today? Can you relate to some of these things? How are they affecting you? So, so what I would say, first of all, Cindy, thank you so much for uh, inviting me to join the conversation. Um, I always take something away from these as much as I share, so if not more. Um, what, I, what I would say, Sean, is that uh, I, I am in those numbers, meaning that, you know, I am seeing it in our business, uh, this tension, one, um, in terms of the wage, wage inflation, so to speak. Um, in terms of, you know, folks we're trying to recruit to our organization, we're having to pay um, for roles that historically, you know, were 10 to 15 percent lower. We're having to pay 10 percent, 10 to 15 percent more for, for, for new hires. So actually, our numbers are a little higher than yours even. Um, the tension is the folks who are here and have been long tenured employees you know, how do we keep them here and keep them engaged, knowing that there's a market uh, and where they can, quite frankly, go make more money potentially by switching a job, sw switching jobs. So I'm seeing that here in our in our uh, business for sure. Um, I would also say the data more than anything, and I'm going to make a plug for ADP's real income data, and maybe just to to back up for a moment because how we make decisions is really about, um, it, it's, it's, we make data-driven decisions. And, you know, when we make those offers to folks, we're in the, you know, in terms of, you know, the 15 to 20% more, we're, we're using real data. So ADP's real income data has been very beneficial to us recently um, in making wage and, and uh, decisions. Also using benchmarks from our uh, consultants and then we participate in a number of surveys. So between survey data, our consultants and the real uh, ADP income data, um, we've been able to make very um, real good real-time decisions with that information. And I, I'm pleased to tell you that based on those three components that really have a lot to do with how we make our decisions today, um, we actually were able to influence a significant increase for our current employee craft um, in, in one of our regions as a result of that information. Um, I won't get into the numbers exactly, but what I will tell you is in my career here at Calpen, I've been here 13 years, been in HR for 10. Um, if I hadn't had the data that I had at my fingertips, um, I would not have been able to influence our CEO and our operating officer, um, our chief operating officer uh, to make that decision around actually increasing compensation for an entire region of craft employees that we're going to make this month. Um, and it, it is definitely this tension that Sean, you highlighted um, that you know, we're all experiencing um, that is really, I think, putting pressure on corporations ever more to really think about annual merit increases. Um, you know, that's another one. Uh, and historically, we, we're very modest on our merit, or some like to say it's a cost of living increase. We say it's kind of cost of labor increase is where we hold our, our hat. And that is that, um, you know, we have, we're, we're gonna meet the market, so to speak, on, on those, um, on merit increase for our employees this year. Um, you know, we like to pride ourselves on the fact that we have a total rewards that is very competitive, not just on base wages. So we look beyond base wages typically, but with this, you know, emerging data and information, um, also very, you know, the labor, the tight labor market, especially in an industrial setting like ours, um, we have to respond to, to the market. Um, last thing I'll add is that, um, there are, given our industry, there are some markets we're making. I know Sean and Cindy, and I talked about this recently about the fact that in some areas in renewable space, we're having to create our own market um, because there is, are not very many benchmarks. So that's a little bit of a daunting, kind of scary uh, 
process for us to go through right now. But anyway, I hope that's helpful. That's very helpful. Thank you. And, and David, given all these factors, um, I'd be curious to get your reaction uh, to what Heather had just mentioned too, plus some of the, some of the factors I shared just before um, she shared her own experience. So again, I'll, I'll echo what Heather said. Um, and thank you very much, Cindy and Sean, for the opportunity to talk. Um, and I'll also talk about a little bit about what Heather was, was speaking on, which is that you can't make decisions these days without having the data to back it up. And um, Heather and I talked about this when we had gotten together before the, the conversation today. And you know, if you look at traditional sources where you see that like salary budget surveys, which showed that most organizations are going from a two and a half to 3% increase, they're now re-examining it. Well, the ones that we saw before June were very flat or maybe a modest increase over 2020 when we all knew, know that the actual increases in 2020 were, were very slight and even non-existent. Whereas now, a lot of the research that's happening post July and August, where we're seeing sharp increases to consumer price indices and a 12 month CPIU that's at 5.4% is that there's a lot of pressure on our employees. And we have to now react because if they're getting price pressures on their side um, and there's so many whispers in their ear about offers where job switchers to your point before Sean that, that's coming from the employment report that shows that they can get at least a 5% increase. A lot of people are going to take those calls and we need to prevent them because we're obviously having a problem finding good people and then losing good people on top of that exacerbates the situation. And so we need to do whatever we can to ensure that the people that we have, we're keeping them and we're keeping them whole, or at least trying to. And we need to use whatever the latest data is. And so one of the attractions, and sorry, I'm going to give another plug to real income. One of the other attractions about real income is that's actually off of real data for real payrolls and real decisions that are happening today. And it gives you the opportunity to see how are things changing month by month. So it may be a one month lag, but that's actually still really good and giving you a, a viewpoint as to where things are actually going today. The other thing I'll say is, is that a lot of the clients that I consult with are re-examining their entire compensation structure from stem to stern. They're starting with what is pay competitively right now because they haven't looked at it in years. And they're actually not even starting with what's competitive pay. They're starting with who are our organization? What are our jobs? Let's look at the job descriptions that we have and actually go back to what is it that we do and modernizing their job descriptions so they're not only accurate for doing recruiting purposes, but also for compensation management. And then once they have the good handle on what are the jobs in our organization, then they use that basis. So they're, they're actually going back and looking at the data that underlies all these analyses. And they're saying, now it's good. Now, now let's go and actually look at what's our market and how much are we paying against what's in market. And I think that's critical to me. Having good data is just, you know, regular hygiene. But so often we kind of say, ah, I'll do that tomorrow or I'll put that off for a little bit. We can't do that, especially to Heather's point. If we're actually giving our CEOs and CIOs and CHROs analyses that aren't accurate because the data that's behind them isn't accurate, then those CXOs are making decisions based on inaccurate information, and that's on us. We need to make sure that those things are right. So as a good consultant, I always start with who are we benchmarking first? and then go to the actual benchmarking and looking at as modern data as we can, as current data as we can, to then lead to some conclusions. And in some cases, we may say we're okay. In other cases, to Heather's point before, we might actually find that we're behind on critical skills in certain areas, or that we may need to make markets in certain areas because there just isn't enough data to do that. And we have to do the best we can and use whatever signals are in the marketplace to allow us to make the best decision, the best business decision that we can for those people. Yeah, thanks so much, David. I appreciate that. Um, Heather, you had mentioned before, you know, making sure that your decisions are indeed based on data. I'd like to go a little bit uh, more under the hood on that one if we could. And tell me about some of the internal and external data sources that you and your organization are using today, maybe even have used. And if even if you have any anecdotal 
thoughts about uh, you know your work, your your history doing this, um, some other sources you've seen to help drive our decision making would be helpful. So, so it's interesting having gone through um, the last month and putting together a proposal to our executive team. Um, I, this is this is you know relevant in that we we leveraged the real income data. We had to go out to the market and look for union contracts. So some of this is self-searching um, uh, because we have to benchmark what are the unions paying, even though we're not 100% union shop, um, that is a barometer for what is the market. Um, and then we're using our consultants. So it's the Mercers of the world, right? And then it's the surveys. It's, gonna, it's going to be, um, uh, I think it's survey.com. I'm not real, real familiar directly with the surveys, but I know that my team responds to um, you know, probably 10 different surveys each year. So it's a combination of those data points that inform our, um, ultimately our, our, our information that we present to our executive team. What we did do, what I will share is we took, we harmonized the data, real ADP, we harmonized um, the Mercer data and we harmonized our survey data um, to, to basically get a blended number um, because we, would, we wouldn't necessarily, we didn't feel it was an accurate depiction if we just used one data point anymore um, as the sole, sole reference. So we harmonized all three data points and, um, and that informed our decision-making. Um, and then on the union piece, we did do that independent because that, that is, uh, we felt comfortable because that's very specific to the locale that we were also measuring, we were, we were comparing. Um, so that is how we typically assess our compensation when we're trying to benchmark internally for specific jobs is leveraging those data points and making a comparison. The other piece of this is, you know, we take it a step further in terms of, okay, what is it I'm asking for? Am I asking to meet the market 100%? No, in our case, for our non-executive roles, non-management roles, we try, to, we try to aim for about the 75th percentile. Um, and so we said, okay, at the 75th percentile and not 100% of the 75th percentile, we ratcheted it down to even 80% of that 75th percentile and presented that to the executives and said, okay, again, we're not trying to meet the market necessarily, but just to stay relatively competitive, how are we doing? And that informed ultimately the decision to add dollars to our budget to the tune of quite a bit, um, in my experience that we've ever added to our budget to be able to basically, again, not meet the market, but to address some of the um, challenges in one of our particular regions. What I will tell you is that um, that, that increase um, that we are going to be making for that region, one might ask, in fact, I, there was a part of me that was a little concerned that my executive team might go, Heather, how did we have such a gap? Like, what, how did this get eroded so quickly? And I think they're all reading the headlines as well. So the good news is, is the press is doing me a favor in that, you know, I don't know if you all saw this, by the way, that um, the COLA went to 5.6%. It hasn't been at 5% since 1998 or something. It, it, it's, it's some, no, I, I apologize. Since 2009, the COLA has not been at 5% since 09. So what is that? 21 years, 22 years ago. So we're seeing, we're seeing wage, you know, and inflation and we're seeing the US government give a cola increase of five point percentage plus that helped in my case with our executive team. And so you know for us, you know, it's all of these data points. It's the, you know, what is what's happening with, with the government in terms of cola. And if you all should know that what that entails or what that means is that anybody who currently gets social security is going to get a five percent plus raise. Uh, in their income next year in 2022, which is pretty substantial. Um, so, you know, for us, those are the data points that we use that inform, you know, our decision making and, and our 
And I will say we've been very fortunate in being able to influence our executive team as a result of having that information at our fingertips like never before. Yeah, thanks, Heather. I, I don't remember that in the 90s. I was just a toddler then, but I appreciate oh, yeah. bringing that mm -hmm. forward. But um, mm -hmm. what, what, one thing that resonated with me was multiple data points, multiple data points. And I definitely yeah. appreciate the plug that both of you made for ADP's new offering. But, uh, but David, I, you know, I've had a conversation with you about this. And I remember what you said um, the last time we talked was that you know, anybody that's doing work on compensation planning is looking for more data, multiple right. data, not less. Absolutely. Expand a little bit more on that. I was, I was fascinated with your comments. Well, I mean, it kind of goes back to what Heather was saying. You never want to use one data point because one data point can be skewed by the participants in the study. And so you want to try and triangulate as much as possible. And so some of it may be um, using multiple survey sources or multiple sources online and offline and be able to get gather as much evidence as you can and be able to, as Heather puts it, and I love your word, harmonize, be able to bring it together to be able to show a picture for what does compensation look like today and what is it predicted to grow as um, for the year? Because we all know that survey sources are at least a year old. And even if you look at the ADP data cloud benchmark data, um, that's a month old, but but okay, so it's a month old. It means it's recent, um, but we still need to project what does that mean for 2022? And if we're going to be giving merit increases and promotional increases and market adjustments to take all of those things into consideration, you know, including the CPI, um, and as Heather says, you know, they're going to be increasing from a COLA perspective, five point something percent. All those things have to come into play. We don't want to continually be behind what's going on in the market. So create a picture and create an almost an accurate or as accurate as you can. And as we know, it's all an art form. There's no science here because all these things are just data points we're bringing together and paint a picture for your CXOs, especially the CFO. The CFO is going to want to know what is the spend that I have to accrue for? What's the spend I have to budget for to make sure that we're as accurate as we can be so I know what we're shooting for for a numbers perspective, whether you're telling the street or you're telling your ownership. You need to be as accurate as possible. I'll mention one other thing is that it doesn't matter whether you're using a piece of software or Excel, but it, make sure that you're including all of your assumptions in everything you do so that the story isn't just rich, but you have your references to where you got it all from and that you can, you know, make sure that the people who are looking at it can trust it and know exactly where you've gotten it from and, and can reference it if necessary. John, can I add? Can I add something? Always. Um, to a couple things. One is, by the way, the cola is six or excuse, is is five point nine percent to be exact. Seventy million Mer seventy million Americans will get a five point nine percent raise. Um, pretty remarkable in twenty twenty two. But but let me offer one other data point that I that we're not talking about, but is was part of the conversation. So it wasn't just what's going on with wage wages, but it's also what's going on internally in terms of our ability to keep people. So what does turnover look like and what's happening with recruitment? Are we able to hire as fast as people are leaving? So the conversation was not one dimensional around compensation. We provided the whole picture and that was the compelling case because it's enough. It's not enough to go to my executive team and say, hey, I need a raise for all these employees. Here's what the market's saying. I also have to demonstrate, and oh, by the way, if we don't do it, here is the implication. That <laughs> is that people are going to leave and I'm not going to be able to attract talent to our company otherwise. So I wanted to make that point that that's really important that you have the full picture. It is not just about the money. It's about how you are retaining and attracting talent to your company to make that business case, so to speak, to your executives to make wage decisions, um, you know, beyond what you normally do today. Um, I think that's really important. And, you know, for us, we are definitely seeing less applicants for key critical jobs 
than we have ever before. I had a meeting with my head of recruitment yesterday and asking this question, why, you know, tell me about the demographics for these jobs, for example, being able to get diversity for specific roles that we're trying to, um, you know, trying to get diversity for. And um, it is, we are not seeing the, the number of applicants that we saw last year or the year before. It's starting to look bleak in some some of the particular areas of our company in terms of being able to attract talent. So my point is, is that you've got to have the full picture. It can't be one dimensional. Uh, thanks for reminding us. That. I know we we're focused just on compensation today, but definitely it, it is about all those other factors and being able to draw people in, entice people to apply and certainly keep the folks that we already have. Um, you know, I, I was talking earlier when we were, when we were taking a look at the landscape that we're, that we're living in and trying to navigate uh, through right now. And I talked about the, you know, the, the Domino's thousand dollar signing bonus sign that I saw and the knee jerk reaction that you see to, to just increase wages, to try and attract people, at least even apply for positions. There's, there's a sweet spot. There's a sweet spot in the salary range of not overpaying for talent. Um, but certainly not underpaying either. And, and I know that it's important that when you bring somebody on board, that their salary is at a level that they're not immediately going to be over market rate, like once they step in and all of their peers are making far less than they are, that creates resentment and a whole host of other like employment problems for us. Like, what, what, what could you say about like identifying like that zone, that zone, not overpaying, not underpaying? hitting that exact right spot to make sure that you're attracting the talent, but keeping the folks that, uh, that already work for you today. So let me start by saying that that means you need to do good analysis about where your pay is today on your current positions. And has, as Heather said, you have to make sure that you keep them. Um, you don't want to try and have to go out and find the best people again, because you lost them some on something silly, like a couple thousand dollars here and there. Yeah. And so keeping a good handle on your salary structures and your not just your starting rates, but where are people today? I'll also say that one of the things that we don't consider about how we focus on the structures and the grades and the jobs is we don't consider career frameworks either. And can we find good places for these people to aspire to? Because people have not been leaving. We've not been doing a good job. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not trying to put anybody down on the phone here, but we haven't really done a good job of making sure people understand how do they get to the next level and what does that next level mean? Whether it's another job at a higher grade or in the same grade and taking a career opportunity in another group. Um, and so sometimes it's not about the money. Sometimes it's about showing them the path forward. And if there are those openings, being able to tell them what do you need to do to get there in order to be able to be more successful and to stay with us because we want you to be here. Even though we're going to be sad to leave you in this group, we want to keep your intellectual property and we want to keep your knowledge here. And so a lot of times it's not just about money. It's about the opportunities that we're affording people and can we show them the pathway forward. And so a lot of the work that I've been doing with companies is around not just around salary structures, but also renovating the career families and making sure that people understand how do they get from one place to another? And can we give managers the tools to encourage that to happen instead of losing really good people? Yeah, I think I, I, you know, for us, um, it is a delicate walk. Um, it's, it's a tightrope. Um, and quite frankly, you know, we've had to you know, make adjustments on our internal folks so that we don't have that friction. Um, you know, we, we've, we have a recent example where we had somebody who was poached from one department to the other. Um, and in order to keep that person, even poaching him to another department from leaving, we had to give him a significant increase. And the other two who were in the other department we poached from, we had to give them a significant increase so they wouldn't leave. So, you know, there were, there's, um, some internal internal machinations that we're definitely facing more often than not so that we keep people. Um, we're not going to always meet, meet their market every time, but you know, more and more I'm seeing us having these conversations um, where, where we're, we're having to make some you know, adjustments on folks so we don't do stupid things, like you said, David, over a few, just a couple thousand dollars. Um, it, it's tricky. It's, I don't know that there's a silver bullet answer right now, but it's, it's tricky. It's, it's one off. Um, it's not wholesale, uh, 
that we can make these decisions. I think it's very um, situational, for lack of a better word. Yeah, you know, um, preparing for this call, we we had a sidebar conversation um, that I think was fascinating. I actually want to bring it back up to discuss today um, because I've been asked maybe three or four times since we since we last talked about this exact scenario. And um, what I'm referring to is, you know, one of the things that uh, the pandemic has driven, I think, our our employers' ability to support work from home scenarios. Um, you know, companies have invested tons and tons of money into the technology to allow people to do what we're doing now, having a, you know, a, a web conference where the videos are working and we can hear each other and it's without a glitch. Um, and, and that really has created a scenario where people widespread, large scale now can live anywhere and work anywhere. And when you think about how that affects compensation, um, you know, if I if I if I live in Montana and work for a New York company, can I have New York wages? Is that all right? Because, man, the house I'll have in Montana with New York wages would be amazing. And that has really become an issue. And I'm asked about it often. I just would love to get your reactions on that scenario. Well, so let me let me share with you. I made reference to this regional adjustment that we're doing. And great question, Sean. We are not adjusting, adjusting base wages. We are actually increasing compensation in the form of a stipend to do exactly what you're suggest, what you're talking about. Just because you live in X region, we are not going to pay you your base at the base wage because we know that many of you want to move to a different region. And what we find ourselves or the dilemma we find ourselves in there is in the other region where there's lower wages are feeling like they're underpaid when their counterpart comes from the other region. So we are giving those increases in the form of a stipend. And in fact, I would say 90% of the increases that we'll be giving are in the form of a stipend to resolve the regional disparity that we do find ourselves in, given our, glo- given our national footprint. Um, that is how we're solving for it. And in fact, what I would tell you is most of the employees like that. Um, it's good for us. It's good for us as a company because it is not subject to overtime in the case of our craft employees. Um, so there's a benefit to us. I think uh, most employees may not realize that, but that is, that is a potential drawback. Um, and it's one of those things that we can take away legally um, if they do shift to a different locale um, while they're working for us. So it provides for a lot of flexibility um, and it's a pretty significant increase on the base of that, that, that stipend in and of itself. It's a very generous stipend. So that's how we've been able to resolve that issue, Sean. Thank you. Uh, that discourages me from, from moving to Montana, actually. I, I think maybe I'll stay put. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, what it's actually doing is it's putting a lot of pressure on rents and, and, um, and home prices in other places. So it's not going to equalize. You're not going to get San Francisco rents in Montana, right? but, but if you try and get a hotel room in North Dakota and you realize that you're going to pay $400 a night, it is telling you that, you know, there is a, there's a, there's a supply and demand, whether it's a hotel or, um, a rent and those rents are going to start to rise when people start moving into those what used to be really low cost areas and prices start to rise because the supply starts to dwindle. And if the demand's high enough, it will equalize, but it's never going to get to the stage where you're going to want, you're going to pay New York rates in Montana. It just, it's not going to happen unless, unless, unless so many people move that things have to because of supply and demand. Sorry about that. I was setting up my next screen to share and uh, my uh, my unmute button just disappeared. Okay. <laughs> so I want to um, I want to drag in a couple of visualizations and have a bit of a conversation and um, around some of uh, some of exactly what we're talking about, you know, the cost of living and um, 
you know, what wages look like by geography and um, access to, to real data um, and share with you uh, a little bit about what some of those trends look like here. So I'm gonna pull up a zip code in Houston, 77002. And we'll just wait for this to populate and I'll describe for you what we're looking at. So in this, this zip code here and uh, close to, to downtown Houston, um, you kind of get a, a sense for, you know, what wages around a metro area look like. I'll zoom out a little bit. So um, the zip code that we're examining right here is in orange. And what this is telling us is the median income for people that live in this particular zip code is just shy of $80,000. Um, and as you start to, to move around the metro area of Houston, you can see through this heat map where darker color reds are higher wages and lighter colors are uh, lower wages, how that, uh, how that can play in a particular area. So if I go out here to this zip code, um, 77028 um, out near uh, Herman, Herman Brown Park, I don't know Houston that well, I live in Atlanta, but um, it's, it's less than half um, just by moving a few miles out of the way. And so I think it's interesting to look at income levels at a geography like this and, and really get a sense for where wages are higher and where they're lower. Um, and I wanted to show you something too. Um, these trend lines I think are very interesting. This is overall employment in this particular zip code. Um, number of employees, and you can see this this valley here. And last June, right when when COVID was uh, was raging, that corresponds with the peak in income uh, that you see in the same location. Um, and what I would share with you is this is a trend that we see in just about every single geography across the country. And unfortunately, it's not a a matter of a fact that employees in this zip code started making more money last June. Uh, that's not true. Um, what happened was those that are on the lower end of the pay spectrum lost their jobs. And that's the unfortunate reality of, of COVID. Um, and those that remained in the workforce were, were higher wage earners. So that created sort of a, a false uh, spike, if you will, sure. uh, in overall wages. And in this location, and really just about every location across the country that uh, certainly that I've examined. Any reflections, reactions on that, Heather, David at all? It just makes total sense. And, you know, one of the things that you have to do is you have to take that into consideration in that conversation we just had around, you know, how are you actually paying in those locations um, that there are going to be fluctuations in pay and that you need to use the latest data to make sure that you're getting whatever the most accurate up to date information is. And I use the annual comp, uh, comp explorer for a lot of my clients and with a lot of my clients. And we tend to look at what's the latest. Um, and then also we love to use the trend lines, sorry for the shameless plug, but we like to use those trend lines that say what's happened after over the last five quarters to make sure that what we're seeing was accurate compared to what the clients were seeing. No, I appreciate that. Um, yeah, I, you know, while you were, while you were sharing that, I, I pulled up, um, some wage information that was specific to a job. I happen to pull up project manager because just about every industry and every organization has those. So I thought they might uh, be relevant for all of us. Um, this heat map right here is, is showing you wages for project managers across the United States. And again, where you see colors that are a bit darker, shades of red are where project managers earn more and areas that you see lighter colors are where they, they are in less. Um, and just to be consistent with that previous visualization we're looking at, uh, the pink down here you see is um, the Houston metro area because I wanted to break down uh, compensation specifically uh, by project managers in the Houston area. Um, as we mentioned early on in the call, this data is, is based on uh, current payroll information. Um, you know, I'll say it again, we said it before, um, you know, anybody that's doing this type of work wants to consume as much different type of of data types as possible to harmonize. I love that too. Harmonize was a was a great way to describe that. Um, you know, I think what's unique about ADP's ability to help you uh, in that regard is to provide you actual payroll data uh, that's updated on a monthly basis. You know, unlike a survey, there's no left or right uh, to the data that we would present. It, it's just taken straight from payrolls, and and when you examine that along with other sources of intelligence that you might be looking at, I think it's really going to yield the best decision-making uh, possible for an organization. 
But let's take a look at, at project managers in Houston, um, just to give you a sense of what that looks like. So you can see the, you can see the, the range, uh, range of pay for project managers where folks that are on the lower end of the earning spectrum are at you know, around 58K, we're talking base salary here, the higher end, 175K and the median is $100,000. Again, we're looking at project managers in Houston. You also get a sense for um, how that pay has changed over the last several quarters. So last September, we were at 99K. This September, we're at 100K. So that role has been pretty flat. Um, you know, I, I do examine different roles in here. Um, certainly, if we were to pull registered nurse, for example, you'd see a, you know, I think it was about a 6% increase over last year to now for obvious reasons. That's a, that's a role that's very much in demand just about in every geography right now. Um, as you scroll down a little bit more too, you also have the ability to understand, again, this is as of last month taken directly from payrolls. Um, if you take a look at overtime, uh, this is telling us that 10% of project managers in the Houston area did earn overtime, which made up 7% of their total compensation package. And you can see what some of those overtime values look like uh, with the median falling right around $4,200 uh, for the year. We also have the ability to provide insight into bonus, uh, where project managers did earn a bonus, 38% of them in the Houston area did, and that made 7% of their total compensation. And you see the median there is about uh, $7,350. Um, commissions too, which I didn't really realize was uh, a pay component for project managers, but in Houston, <laughs> in Houston it is. <laughs> Um, 8% of project managers in Houston uh, earn commissions, uh, which made up a pretty good chunk of their total compensation, uh, 17%. So that is probably specific to, a, to an industry, um, is my guess. I'm not sure which one, but, uh, but uh, for sure. What else um, I think is interesting is to take a look at uh, distribution of wages by, by tenure um, as well. And so this is really interesting to me because when you start to examine like for how long someone has been at their current employer and what their salary looks like for a specific role, kind of doing that analysis of like comparing a, someone who's new at the organization to somebody that's been there from one to two to three to four years. Um, you can see 15 plus 116, 10 to 15, 115, five to 10 is 100. And as you start to get down um, into the into the lower ranges, uh, ranges. Um, you can see under one year we're at 93 and one to two is right about the same. And what I'll tell you is I've pulled many jobs um, where the under one year value is greater than the one to two and the three to five year values. And that is, that's, that's what we were talking about earlier where, you know, if you're with the same employer, year over year, as I have been with ADP, you know, sometimes you get stuck in that, that, that annual increase, the cost of living adjustment, whatever you want to call it at 3% year over year. But go back to that first slide, we showed job switchers are seeing the greatest increase uh, in pay and people that are moving from a job are going to often come in at a higher level and see a, a greater amount of compensation than those who've been enrolled for, for just a few years. So um, we certainly see that in the real data. Um, and it plays itself out, I think, in, in everything we see uh, day to day. Heather, David, uh, reactions? Well, the only thing I would say is, is that, um, again, going back to this exercise we've just been through, you know, it's been important for us to not just look at the base wage, but the total compensation. In fact, we went back to the we went back to the well three times, and the third time was the charm that we brought back all, we, we, we brought back a total compensation um, comparison and the data that's provided here through the real ADP um, uh, income resource, as well as the other two that I mentioned, the survey data and the um, Mercer data that we harmonized, we ended up looking at total compensation as well. And so that helped inform. So, you know, it's not just base wages. I think you can get um, caught up a little too much in the base wage, you know, uh, war, so to speak, sure. you know, versus selling on the total compensation package. So we, we really, we really tend to make our decisions based on total rewards as opposed to just the base wage. And Heather, I, I guess I want to ask you a question on that. How much do you communicate to all levels 
at what their total opportunity is and what is their total reward. And do you offer them total reward statements to ensure that they have a good focus at all times on how much they're getting paid overall? Yes, actually we have total reward statements. We've been doing that for about five, five or six years. Uh, we used to mail them to the homes until we had employees say, please don't do that. Uh, I don't want my spouse to know how much money I'm making. <laughs> so, so, so we went. That's out of the bag now. Yeah, so it's out of the bag. So we actually uh, publish that every quarter. It's updated with um, real, real earnings. And we talk in terms of total rewards Good. at Calpine. We don't talk about base wages. Um, uh, and, and we have found that people make better decisions and are a little more um, realistic about, about it, about compensation when you talk in those terms, and especially as they consider moving to other companies Absolutely. or attracting talent. You know, we always, we always talk in those terms. And in fact, we are in the process of updating our offer letters to show a total reward package, as opposed to just your base salary and your bonus opportunity. I'll, you have to tell you a story because um, one of the things that is remarkable about this is that a lot of times people focus on the one number, that base salary number, yeah. and they just, they're just they just not making good business decisions, not good personal decisions when they decide to leave. And they, they see the grass being greener and they see these opportunities out there. And there are companies who, um, as of recently, are still paying things like um, uh, defined benefit plans. And um, they're actually, they're actually, there are some companies that are still doing pensions, and they'll not, they'll not remember the fact that this company is contributing to not only my four hundred one k, which is kind of more near real term um, retirement funds, but also a pension for me as well. And so they don't take those things into consideration when they're making their moves, and they 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 go for the grass being greener on the other side, and then they look back and they go, oh my god. Why didn't somebody tell me that I lost all of that money that was just sitting there waiting for me at, at my retirement when I go to look at the entire package? Yeah. You know, my benefits contributions are higher. You know, I have a, a worse network I'm going to be going to. Um, my, my, my rates are just worse here for things like vision and dental. And they don't realize that until they actually make the move when all it takes is a good communications effort like you're talking about, Heather, to let them know this is what rewards are on an overall basis. And I'm going to give that up if I leave. Yeah. 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 It's been, it's been very um, eye opening for, for our employees. And especially in the early days, it was very eye opening for folks to see, um, you know, when you, especially we pride ourselves in our company on our benefits package, our health benefits package, we're above market on that. And so I think that's, that's also a, been a, been a good retention tool, so to speak. Sure. Cindy, uh, have we had questions come through? Anything that uh, we can provide additional thoughts around? Don't have any questions, but I do have one question for Heather. One of the reasons that um, I really wanted Heather on this uh, uh, discussion is because they have employees that are knowledge workers. They have employees that are union. They have employees that are trade. And sometimes you're just in a company where there's more, you know, that they have all of them. And so I guess my question to Heather would be, are there any specific things that you would talk about with respect to any of those, those employee kind of uh, groups that you might share with everyone? Because we've been talking kind of, of overall that you have them all here, Heather, you have yeah. all of them. So yeah. is there anything specifically for any, any of those groups that you would share with everyone on today? Well, wh what I would say is that one, I, you're right. Um, we have a very diverse uh, workforce, um, including we have a commercial workforce. Um, and so compensation is different and across um, our employee groups. Uh, but I would say, what I would say though, is universally everyone understands when we talk about total rewards, um, um, that said though, maybe to answer your question more pointedly is our craft employees, um, you know, we probably spend the majority of our time, I would say 95% of my time and my HR team's time is spent with the craft employees believe it or not. It is not the commercial, it is not the knowledge worker. 
Um, you know, it is truly the craft employee who is the one, are the ones who generally have the most to say about their wages and are coming to us repeatedly about how they're paid um, than any other part of our workforce in our company, hands down. And in fact, what I would also share is that universally, but for one small part of our company, everybody's on the same incentive plan. Um, and so the incentive plan never comes up. It's really base hourly wage and those particular craft and particularly the craft employees who, who raise that. So we're benchmarking a lot. We're getting up in front of our employees. In fact, we changed our entire wage um, program for one segment of our craft employees up in Northern California three years ago um, uh, because they do compare themselves, even though they're not a union shop, they compare themselves to unions, which is why I mentioned earlier that we have to look at the sure. union contract, union uh, contracts just to understand what are those, just so we're prepared. But um, I hope that answers your question where, where we spend the most time is with our craft employees and specifically on their hourly wage. Yeah, it, it answers my question, but I just want to also point out that you know, you've got all these different kinds of employees and not every company does. Yeah. I guess I would just ask David if he had any comments around that too, because it becomes a pretty complex picture when you've got yeah. to look at all these different <laughs> kinds of employees. And is there any, yeah. David, is there any kind of, of advice that you would give someone that has that, all of that in their, you know, in their organization? Be flexible. <laughs> Don't think that one size fits all. Um, and Heather, you mentioned that one incentive plan. I think one incentive plan is great because that means everybody understands what the goals of the company are and they're all going to work together. But you definitely have different base salary plans for the different groups, right? Right. Yeah. So, so you got to be flexible on certain things and you can be inflexible on others, but you just need to make sure that you're paying people the right way make sure they understand why they're getting paid and how, and make sure they understand what the differences are. One of the things that we've heard time and time again recently is transparency is important. And while some companies say, oh, transparency, I can't do that. Some of these things are secret. Remember, there's this thing called the internets and it is not going away. And if you think that they can't find how other people are getting paid, they can, and they are, and they understand it, or at least the more educated of them, of them can. So they will find out how other things happen and you need to be careful for that and make sure you understand how to communicate those things. When I worked for Morgan Stanley, we used to say it's a fireball offense to talk about your pay. That's no longer the case. That was in the early nineties. It's no longer the case. People are talking and they're posting, whether it's on Glassdoor or other places, they're posting their pay. Yeah, they are. You need to deal with it. Yeah. So Sean, do you have any final comments before I kind of wrap it up? No, I just wanted to thank Heather and, and David. Very insightful, very thoughtful. Really enjoyed the conversation today. Thank you, Cindy, for giving us the platform to do this. Thank you all for uh, thank you, taking the time to join. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you all. And just so you guys know, I mean, I'm really excited that the fact that ADP is allowing anyone, no matter if you've got a Workday or a, or an Ultipro or whatever HCM, you can actually get this, this data. And if I was still a CHRO, that would be a real value because I, like Heather, I would be using all kinds of data points to try and figure this out. So hopefully this was helpful. If you need any information at all from either Sean or David, or maybe even Heather, let me know and I can put you in touch and then look for a follow-up with the recording and the slides. So thanks everybody for being here. Appreciate it. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Thanks, Heather. Thank you.